The 16th summit of the Economic Cooperation Organization saw key discussions on Central Asia. What was on the agenda? And finally, a vital ruling by Australian High Court has reversed a 20-year-old precedent when it comes to indefinite detention. What did the court decide? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before you go any further, please hit the subscribe button. One of the areas where the effects of the Ukraine war is most visible is Central Asia. The United States has sought to use the war to push its own agenda in the region. But the US and Russia are not the only players. China, Turkey and Iran all have major stakes. In this context, the 16th Summit of the Economic Cooperation Organization, a forum of countries of the region, was keenly watched. We go back to Abdul for details of the summit that was held in Kazakhstan. Abdul, the 16th Economic Cooperation Organization summit taking place in Tashkent, actually very important region. Uh, for multiple reasons, of course, uh, which you talked often about on this show, there is definitely an angle of geopolitical rivalry that is taking place over there, especially in the context of the Ukraine war. There is, of course, the Afghan crisis as well, which is, you know, in which all the countries concerned are definitely involved in various ways. So could you maybe first take us through, you know, a bit about the organization itself and its mandate and also what really was covered during the summit? Uh, ECO is a very interesting uh, organization, uh, particularly given the fact that the reason, Central Asian reason, is uh, one of those reasons in the world politics, which basically is not much talked about. And so it was basically formed, uh, of course, is a successor of an earlier organization, but it was basically formed in 1985. It is headquartered in uh, Tehran, and it has 10 members, including Afghanistan and Azerbaijan. Uh, as you rightly pointed out while uh, asking the question that, Afghanistan has been uh, uh, constant, constantly uh, in war ever since, uh, you can say, uh, the establishment of uh, uh, the organization. And there has been a long-lasting conflict in between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, which, is, uh, which has also impacted its functioning. Apart from that, of course, the Iranian situation, which basically has been under sanction ever since uh, the uh, revolution in 1979, has also kind of complicated its uh, objectives. The basic mandate of the organization was to kind of uh, imagine, uh, rem uh, remember that this organization was created at a time when the uh, uh, a kind of neoliberal uh, globalization was on its uh, kind of peak and there was an attempt to create as many free trade areas as possible at the time. So basic mandate of the organization was to create a free trade area among all the uh, countries in the region. Uh, of course, that has not materialized apart from the fact that uh, there has been greater economic cooperation among all the countries, uh, despite the sanctions, despite the war, and despite the uh, instabilities in countries, other member countries like in Pakistan, for example, which is, uh, uh, which is also a very important country. So uh, given all these complexities and given the fact that this is one of the reasons which basically is often neglected, uh, uh, ECO has been uh, quite, uh, you can say, meaningfully uh, engaged, uh, kind, quite meaningful for uh, in terms of the overall economic cooperation in the region. Right, Abul. So, what was really uh, on, you know, what what was happening at the summit in terms of what were the kind of major uh, aspects of discussion? Well, apart from the issue of uh, Palestine, which was raised by Iran and other uh, member countries, uh, despite uh, it was not being officially included as a man as a as something to discuss uh, uh, on the agenda, uh, uh, this was one uh, thing, of course, which was discussed. And it seems the majority of the countries in those uh, uh, in the grouping expressed their solidarity with the Palestinian issue. But uh, when it comes to the larger economic mandate, of course, uh, uh, they talked about all the countries have basically started talking about strengthening the uh, economic corridors, uh, which have uh, which have been basically strengthened uh, due to the BRT uh, involvements of China into it, which basically has strengthened the infrastructure in all the Central Asian countries in particular and uh, um, uh, uh, countries in Pakistan, for example, uh, countries like Pakistan. So uh, there is there is a talk of kind of linking the Central Asia, which is a landlocked region, 
with uh, through pakistan uh, with the, uh, uh, to the sea arabian sea so that the, there can be greater trade uh, of all these countries so that was one discussion there there is another attempt to kind of create another link uh, through turkey uh, uh, to uh, basically to the mediterranean and beyond so it Th uh, that was a primary uh, discussion apart from the fact uh, that it also uh, uh, basically talked about strengthening whatever bilateral and the multilateral agreements which are they are part of the uh, eco already for example there is an asgabad uh, agreement uh, among all the five central asian countries to uh, create more connectivity through infrastructure uh then there is uh, uh, of course there is brt which has connected all the countries including pakistan now it is uh, uh, increasingly uh, building infrastructure in iran as well so that iran can also be used as a link between the central asian countries and uh, the countries in west asia and other parts of the world is basic was basically the primary uh, uh, you can say agenda on uh, during this summit apart from the fact of uh, the turkey uh, so the, the Tur uh, turkey also has basically proposed another corridor uh, passing through iran again iran and turkey and so these three uh, corridors uh, corridor between central asia through iran corridor between central asia through pakistan and corridor through uh, central asia iran and turkey where the primary uh, uh, was the primary agenda of course i will also finally for the benefit of our viewers we could sort of tell us the kind of you know geopolitical uh, games that are really taking place in that area because recently with the armenia azerbaijan conflict we saw the united states also making a very sustained intervention in what is long considered uh, russia's backyard as well and turkey is also involved iran is also involved so yeah so central asia is now uh, gaining much more attention primarily because uh, earlier attempts by the us uh, to intervene in the region post 1990s uh, did not uh, bring that uh, great result because russia uh, asserted its authority in the region then china also basically pitched in through economic cooperation because the, uh, and through the seo shanghai cooperation organization which most of the central asian countries are part of now uh, it has expanded and iran and uh, other countries are also becoming members of it so because of the chain strong chinese uh, uh, and russian presence in the region uh, uh, given their uh, larger uh, geographical proximity and given their historical uh, close links with all these countries it was difficult for the us to kind of go uh, make in roads and create uh, the kind of uh, grounds there for uh, launching uh, its larger uh, you can say uh, approaches a larger strategy towards the region to control for particularly uh, the iranian uh, iranian and uh, uh, the chinese uh, uh, in, uh, involvement in the region which has basically has not materialized for a very long time uh, but as you rightly pointed out because of the uh, armenia azerbaijan uh, 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 recent uh, developments in which turkey has taken a certain stand uh, turkey took certain stand which basically uh, has created a possibility for the us and israel to kind of create a, a greater kind of links with these two countries and kind of move in this is also related to what is happening in ukraine so uh, since it is considered that russia is more involved in ukraine russia has less energy and resources time to basically devote to the reason and this is seen as a perfect uh, time to kind of intervene uh, there but uh, i think despite the uh, these uh, openings created for the us uh, due to the Azer uh, armenia azerbaijan conflict or due to the ukraine war it seems it is it will be very difficult for the us to kind of uh, have any uh, presence which will re replace uh, russians or the chinese uh, for for various reasons as i said before because of the historical reasons and because of the uh, larger economic integration which uh, seo uh, brt and russia uh, aggressive russian involvement in the region has created so it is it will be not easy for the us to kind of play its geopolitical games in the region at it looks uh, uh, from the southwest but abdul thank you so much for the analysis and finally a few days ago the australian high court declared that indefinite detention of asylum seekers is illegal the verdict is likely to impact scores and marks a reversal of a 20 year old precedent 
we go to Anish for the details. Anish, can you tell us a bit about this verdict? Uh, activists calling it a landmark uh, decision as far as a lot of people who are in Australia, you know, uh, as, as far as the settlement is concerned, refugees are concerned. What is really this verdict about? Uh, well, the verdict primarily talks about uh, whether or not the government can hold people indefinitely in detention uh, in, because they are asylum seekers or irregular uh, or undocumented asylum seekers that have come into the country. Now, uh, the thing is that in 1992, uh, when the Australian government, then a Labour government actually, uh, created a new set of laws that actually allowed for indefinite detention, it was challenged in the Supreme, uh, in the High Court uh, previously in 2004. They gave out a uh, verdict saying that the law was constitutional uh, because as long as the government had the eventual intention that they will somehow deport uh, these people uh, they can hold them under indefinite detention. Now, the thing is that uh, the same High Court is now uh, finding it that if the government has not been able to find any clear uh, place for this, uh, these people to actually find another place, uh, a safe deportation, so to say, uh, it cannot really hold them under indefinite detention. And that's the most important part of it. The case of the person's character background is uh, irrelevant in this matter, and it's the fact that they have been held under indefinite detention with no charges, with uh, no uh, you know cases against them or anything that actually prevents them under common uh, laws or common uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, legal structure. And so this uh, is going to be a landmark decision because this actually essentially reverses the last 20, 30 years of uh, you know, system that actually allowed governments after government to actually indefinitely de detain hundreds, thousands of people, uh, whether, or they, whether or not they came by boats, whether they had their visas expired. So it is going to have a significant impact, especially on people who are stateless. In this specific case, uh, we can actually look at uh, the fact that there was, you know, problematic history with this person. He was convicted of uh, a very serious crime and obviously the countries that Australia tried to send him to uh, as part of its deportation program did not work. And the fact that he's a Rohingya Muslim may meant that he cannot be deported back to Myanmar uh, where he will be completely unsafe, where he's not even recognized as a citizen. So this person, it's the, the question for the court was simply whether or not this person had uh, or was safe to be deported. A, or would be deported to begin with, and if he is not to be deported uh, in under any foreseeable future, then this person is not liable to be kept under detention indefinitely. And this is something that is going to affect, as I said, like multiple people, around 92 people at the very least, according to activists and different estimates, are, uh, are, are going to be impacted because they are uh, people who are stateless, who have come to Australia seeking asylum because they are, uh, you know, a persecuted minority back home and they cannot be returned back uh, under any circumstances because it would be completely unsafe for them. And so this is what the ruling pretty, pretty much boils down to. It uh, really just uh, asks the question of whether the government can detain any kind of person uh, indefinitely. Uh, and but uh, this is this is, this might also have repercussions on other kind of asylum seekers who cannot be uh, detained under different circumstances. Either. Right, Anish. Of course, like you said, while in this case the specific instances of us was of a man committed uh, convicted of very serious crimes, the, la the the judgment itself has a much larger implication. And I think we've talked about some of these issues during COVID nineteen also when Australia had a very problematic you know approach towards refugees. Definitely, definitely, because at the time uh, this actually came uh, was highlighted primarily because uh, the offshore uh, asylum detention centers uh, came into light. Uh, about dozens of people at, at the time, I think more than 100, 130 or 140 people were uh, held under different offshore detention facilities, including in Nauru and Papua New Guinea. And that uh, was pretty much at the highlight. And many of them had to be evacuated because of COVID-19 outbreaks. And so the question came up, and most of them, none of them were convicted of any other crimes. Uh, most of them were, uh, you know, very genuine asylum seekers who did not have the means to go through the regular channels, as the government insists. Many of them came by boat. 
And so these uh, people had to be evacuated immediately. And some of them who were evacuated were kept under other kind of indefinite detention within Australia. So it was a very inhuman kind of system. And Australia is one of the few, uh, so to say, higher income uh, economies uh, or you know, part of an, uh, all sorts of uh, human rights charter who still has uh, this set of uh, immigration laws that actually allows for an indefinite detention. And it is something that none of the governments, or the successive or even the current one, have uh, shown any intention to change. And this actually puts into uh, risk uh, a lot of people, including ch children. Many of the detainees who came to Australia by boat as teenagers, like this person uh, in question, but also others. And uh, they were kept under uh, you know, a different sort of in detention. Right now, Australia detains about, has a, uh, has a detained population of about a thousand or more across in uh, across the country and also some in the uh, you know offshore detention uh, at least a hundred or so children among them and so these uh, people are also to be considered when the implications of this ruling is going to be unraveled in the coming days thank you so much anish for that and that's all we have in today's episode of daily debrief we'll be back tomorrow meanwhile do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and if you're watching this on youtube do hit that subscribe button Thank you.